Hey everybody, this is Travis from Bethany Community Church and I wanted to say hi to all of you. What are we doing on Facebook Live in the middle of a Thursday? Well, uh, we're starting a new sermon series on the book of Mark, which is one of the Gospels, one of the books of the Bible that tells the story of Jesus. And last week would have been our first week in that sermon series, but I was sick, I wasn't able to be there. Thankfully, James, our friend from Englewood Presbyterian, was able to cover for me, so really appreciated that. But I did, felt like I wanted to have a chance to kind of give y'all an overview of the book of Mark. Like, what are some foundational things that we need as we continue to study this book throughout Lent? So we're just going to kind of talk through Mark very briefly. If you're watching this online, uh, we're on Facebook Live, we're going to be on YouTube later. I just hope that this is helpful to anybody as they look at the Gospels as they look at the witness of Jesus. So we'll just dive right in. Before we do, I want to mention, it's really good to have a Bible that you like, that you enjoy reading, and there's a million translations out there. The two that I find to be most helpful, uh, one is, uh, this is the NRSV Harper Study Bible. So I've had this one a long time. You can tell it's all taped up and beat up. The NRSV is the translation that I grew up with, and I really like it. It just flows well for me. It uses inclusive language, so I like that a lot. Uh, during our Job series, I was using uh, another translation called the New Living Translation. You can't really tell what this is from the video, but that's my New Living Translation study Bible. Key there is find a study Bible that you like. You can just look this up on Amazon or on any kind of book webpage, but when you get a study Bible, it gives you notes, it gives you outlines. It's, it's just kind of helpful for getting your heads around it. And you don't have to be a Bible scholar to appreciate a study Bible. It's designed to be user-friendly, no matter who you are or where you're coming from. So before we can get into the Gospel of Mark, we need to talk about the way the New Testament starts. And I'm going to use my whiteboard up here, and I'm going to apologize in advance because my handwriting is not uh, the greatest. It's more artistic than it is communicative. So for the artwork that you're about to enjoy, you're welcome. So there are four books that begin the New Testament of the Bible. Remember, the, New, the Bible is divided into two halves, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have Matthew, you have Mark, you have Luke, and you have, you have John. These are the four Gospels. The Gospels are all stories, presentations of the life of Jesus. Now, the Gospel that we're preaching on is over here, the Gospel of Mark. And before we get into the facets of Mark, I just want to say Mark has the closest relationships with the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Some scholars call those the synoptic Gospels. That means there is a sharing of stories and presentations of who Jesus is and what he's about within these three Gospels. The fourth Gospel, John, is kind of its own dog. It's unique. It's written very beautifully, very artistically, but it's just a different animal. So it's kind of off on its own. The important thing to know about the Gospels is they're all telling the same story, the story of Jesus, the story of his life, his death, and his resurrection. They're just telling it from different angles. A, a way to think about this might be if you've ever uh, gotten into painting or artwork, you know that there are painters who have taken on a historical scene and they've painted it from different vantage points, right? You may have one artist who depicts uh, a certain historical event and they depict it from a distance and you can kind of see the landscape around it. Another artist might depict it up close and personal and you see people's faces and the sweat on their brows and what they're up to. The point is, is that all four Gospels tell the story of Jesus in unique ways, but they all tell the same story. They don't contradict each other. They don't mess each other up or trip each other up. Now, getting into Mark's Gospel, most scholars believe that Mark's Gospel was the first gospel to be written in terms of a historic timeline. When do they think it was written? Well, I'm just taking a look at my notes here. Likely, Mark was written around AD 65 to 70. Now, if you're assuming kind of a basic timeline, what this means is the gospel of Mark was the first gospel to be written down. The stories of Jesus before the Gospel of Mark came along were told orally. They were shared with family groups. They were shared in house churches. The stories of Jesus had never really, we think, been written down until AD 65 to 70. Now, what's happened in between the resurrection of Jesus and this time frame? There's been a tremendous persecution of the church by the Roman Empire. 
there has been a tremendous spread of the church around the ancient Near Eastern world. So the church has both grown in its prominence, but it's also grown in its persecution. So Mark is the first scholar who says, you know, we should probably write down the stories of Jesus before the people who were eyewitnesses to these stories start to die off. We don't want to lose this history. You see this even now in some of the projects around World War II and the Holocaust. There's a huge movement, has been for generations, to capture the stories of people who are actually there before the memories are lost. That's basically what Mark is doing here. It's an accurate, trustworthy accounting of eyewitness reports of what Jesus did and who he was. Mark is divided into two halves. Again, this is, most scholars would say this, so kind of accept it as sort of the mainstream here. Mark is 16 chapters total, okay, which makes it the shortest of the Gospels. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verses, chapters 1 through 8 are kind of the first half, and chapters 9 through 16 are the second half. Now, how do we know this is divided? Mark didn't just come along and say, like, here's the first half, here's the second half. As scholars read through the Bible, as they study it carefully, they start to come to these realizations about the way that this text was structured. So chapters 1 through 8 is all about Jesus' miracles, his ministry, and his teaching in and around a region known as Galilee. When the attention shifts in chapters 9 through 16, it is all about Jesus' life and ministry and the events that are surrounding him in Jerusalem. Some scholars would say that chapters 1 through 8 of the Gospel of Mark are kind of his, his background, his sort of story of origin. And 9 through 16 is an extended take on what's called the Passion Account, which is when Jesus is heading toward the cross as he is facing his death. So those are kind of the two divisions. What's the main thing that Mark's gospel is trying to communicate? Well, it's communicating about Jesus, right? But specifically, what's Mark hoping his audience will hear? Unlike many of the gospel authors, Mark rolls his thesis statement out, his main idea, right at the beginning. Listen to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It says this in the NRSV, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark isn't hiding who Jesus is. He's not sort of drawing people into this narrative then to reveal the full truth to them. He says it right from the get-go. This is Jesus, and when we say Jesus, we mean the Son of God, the one who has been proclaimed. And a big part of Mark's narrative focuses on connecting the dots between what has been prophesied, what people said long ago about Jesus, and how Jesus actually arrives in the world, and how it meets and fulfills those prophecies. So right out of the gate, Mark tells you what he's about. And there's a reason for this. I think this is just really wise in how the Holy Spirit kind of authored this through Mark. In this historical context, I mentioned this a moment ago, the people of God, the people of the church, were living under the rule of the Roman Empire, particularly under an emperor named Nero. You can look him up in the history books. Nero was a violent emperor. Some emperors were a little bit more passive. Some didn't care so much about the church. Nero cared a great deal about making sure that the church never took off. And he did not want the ministry and mission of Jesus to succeed. So the Christians were being persecuted and really just crushed under the reign of Nero during this time. And so they were people who were familiar with suffering. You might even say that their lives were kind of fraught with suffering. They were used to getting kind of beat down and disappointed. They didn't really know if one day Roman soldiers would come in and arrest them for being people who follow Jesus. Now, most of us don't live like that who are watching this. There are people who are following Jesus around the world who do live with that reality daily. But most of us, that's a very abstract concept. But what we are familiar with in our day is this idea of disappointment, of feeling like, man, it, can we go and do things now? Like, are we at a stage now with this pandemic that we can really step out? Is it safe to do that? Can it, is, it, is it trustworthy to do that? And what Mark does is he depicts people who are kind of in this mix of uncertainty and persecution, and he shows how Jesus meets with them and shows up for them. Like, I'm getting a smile on my face just thinking about it. Every single character depicted in the Gospel of Mark is 
basically finding Jesus under some kind of duress. They are under duress. They are in tough situations. The people who seek Jesus' miracles, who are sick or who have demons, the people who are on the outside and are drawn in by him. This happens to the, the disciples. The disciples are a hot mess in Mark's gospel. They are human beings who don't get what's going on. They are distracted. They are frustrated. And it's kind of frustrating to read about them because they so often miss the mark. And yet, that's the whole point. That is the whole point of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus meets us in our distress. He meets us when we feel like we don't have anything that we can put our feet down on and trust. And our hope in going through this sermon series and throughout the Gospel of Mark is that we will continually encounter the real living hope that is Jesus Christ. We don't have to wait for life to be perfect to follow Jesus, trust Jesus, seek Jesus. We can do it right now, just as broken as we are, just as helpless as we are in this moment. Because that's how Jesus met the people in the gospel. I want to encourage you to find a way to spend time in the gospel of Mark uh, in the season ahead. If you uh, attend our church or if you go on our church's website, we have these bookmarks available that are a, a week by week reading guide for the book of Mark. Actually, it's broken out into daily segments, so please pick up one of these so you can read along with us. If you want to go a little bit deeper, there's tons of great commentaries out there. One that I would recommend is called Mark for Everyone. It's by N.T. Wright or Tom Wright. He is a scholar. He was the Bishop of Durham in England. Very well-regarded biblical scholar. Would encourage you to go a little bit deeper uh, through those resources. Thanks for taking a minute to watch this video. Hope it's helpful to you as we get into this study of the Gospel of Mark. As always, you can find out more about our church and our ministry at churchbcc.org backslash eastside. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you soon. Hope you'll join us for worship 9 a.m. this Sunday here at Inglewood Presbyterian Church. Again, this is Travis from Bethany. Thank you for joining us. Take care.